it's a trauma, it's a major right. loss. It's a loss of innocence, your loss of identity, your loss of self. Um, you ask yourself, who am I if I'm not a mother, um, if I'm not a father? Um, it's a, a real loss, it's like a death. And now you have to stand up in this world and say, hello, I'm regular like everybody else, but you're not. You're kind of dying slowly inside because you don't know how to grasp with all the emotions that you're facing. Welcome back to another episode of That's an Issue. When it comes to the world, when there are challenges within someone's family, whatever it is, it's often dealt with privacy. Now, the challenge that the Jewish community struggles with is that there's such a close-knit bond in the Orthodox community that when people are going through some struggles, um, very often they get very closed up because they don't, people know so much about them already. It, it could get very complicated very quickly. So often, a lot of times when people are struggling with, with whatever it is, whether it's their marriage, having children, uh, their finances, whatever it is, it's, it's often very, it's kept quiet. Now, it's no secret that uh, around the world and as well as in the Jewish community, there are, there are folks that are struggling to have children. And sometimes people uh, don't even have the opportunity, the ability to have children. And there are people that adopt. And when my wife told me about Yeti Katz and how vocal she is in the fact that her and her husband were unable to have children and the fact that they're so vocal about their two children that they adopted and they're so open about it, I looked at her Instagram page and actually saw her by something. I'm like, whoa, she this is someone that, that I think more of everyone needs to know about. And this is, is I think, ultimately a very heartwarming conversation. So a very informative conversation about, um, you know, we're not here to tell people this is how to go about everyone goes about their struggles in their own way but it, it was it, it is nice to see how vocal yeti and her son ellie melch are and her the entire family um about their challenges and how they could be uh, a light and honestly a resource to people that are going through a challenge so here is the wonderful conversation with dr tara kleshik yoni kleshik yeti and ellie melch katz Mental health, relationships, those are loaded topics and something that affects every part of our lives. But we aren't having enough open conversations about it. And that's an issue. Welcome, Katz family over here. Um, we're so happy to have you on. Thank you for having us. <laughs> so I'm going to just jump right in and ask for you to tell us your, I don't know how to call it, challenging journey. um unique journey journey story um starting from the beginning or when we um adopted ellie mella okay so right that's already adoption over here i guess what led up to that um what led up to that so i would say i told him today 26 years ago today we actually got our first diagnosis which told which the doctor told my husband and myself that I would probably never be able to have a baby. And if I even could, it would be through IVF. And I remember just to give you an idea of what it's like being 22 and not knowing anything, I looked at the doctor and I said, I'm not doing it. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, it's against halacha. And he's like, and everyone like was what? And I'm like, well, yeah. And he said, I could tell you a list of rabbis that say it's okay. And I knew nothing. And I think that's something that um, shocked me. I think it's something that takes away from a person's innocence. I believed that I was going to get pregnant easily and no problem and nothing in the world was going to stop it. I prepared for pregnancy my whole life, you know, planning on being a mother. And then all of a sudden I never felt sucker punched before. And this was the first time I ever felt that. Um, Wait, how long were you married at we that point? We were married a year and a half. Okay. And. Um, I just remember feeling devastated um, that my innocence was stolen from me and now a new reality I had to face. So you didn't know anyone no. who I was dealing with infertility at I that knew time. of people and I was the one going like get anybody else, but I never, they don't have kids. And I was like right. a teenager and now all of a sudden I'm in that like room. Right. I'm in that, on that path, this new path that I wasn't expecting. Um, 
I, I tell people a lot of times that something that you don't realize is happening to you is you have, it's a trauma, it's a major right. loss. It's a loss of innocence, your loss of identity, your loss of self. Um, you ask yourself, who am I if I am not a mother, um, if I'm not a father? Um, it's a, a real loss. It's like a death. And now you have to stand up in this world and say, hello, I'm regular like everybody else, but you're not. You're kind of dying slowly inside because you don't know how to grasp with all the emotions that you're facing. Um, so with that, we of course, you go for the second opinion, you go for a third opinion, you try different treatments and you hope that, you know, I once even called the doctor, I gave him some numbers and he's like, I'm sorry, I can't even help you. And that was over the phone. Wow. Um, so we went through this course for many years, um, watching family members get married after us. I remember one sister-in-law asked me after a, one of my brother-in-laws got engaged and she said, how are you feeling? I said, well, once again, it's just me and my husband in the family album and everyone else is starting to have their families right. in the family album. Um, so it's, it, it really takes a toll on, it could take a toll on the marriage. And it's something that I'm a big believer in therapy. So my husband and I went into therapy and we talked about it. When did you go into therapy? I would say, um, I don't know, a year after, just in general. A year after you, after you, after we got married a year after. And then after that, we just started, um, going regularly more about infertility, not trying to figure out communication to poor couples or whatever. Right. Um, and we talked a lot about like things that would happen in either family, how we dealt with it, how my husband would feel, um, how I would feel different, you know, things taking place. Were there, sorry to interrupt you. Please do. Were there like a lot of insensitive comments and things like that made? So I feel like I, you know, I used to, I believe that education is key. I don't believe people are outright insensitive when I speak to women going through infertility. And I used to, before there was social media, I would pick, I would call up friends and they would call up their friends. And I would go into people's houses, you know, in Brooklyn, I did upstate, I did throughout Farakway and Lawrence, and I would do a group of 10 women max. And I would talk about my journey and I would always express that not everyone is like me. And some people will not talk, but I want you to know what it's like going through infertility so you can maybe be more aware. So with that said, I don't believe people are insensitive. I think that people are uneducated and um, when you educate them, they have a better idea of what to say, what not to say. People that don't get the message, I consider, please excuse me, stupid. <laughs> and then there are the people that, um, you know, are insensitive, are the ones that know what you're going through. And I always like to compare with Ehud ben takes the knife, sticks it in the fifth rib and twists it because they know how they want to hurt you. Wow. And that to me is a really insensitive person. Someone who knows what you're experiencing right. and still does something. To cause you that pain. That's worse mm. than insensitive. That's like... Malicious. Really, that's malicious. malicious. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. But I feel like people aren't outright. They just don't know any better. Mm-hmm. Like, right. you know, that's why education is key. Um, people always say that infertility is taboo. When I started out, yeah. 27 right. years ago. That you ago, didn't know what IVF, Infertility was right. taboo 27 right. years ago. Today, I think there's so much more out there. But I was telling someone recently that, like, every year there's a whole new batch of people coming, getting married... Entering the world of, you know, adulthood of the marriage world. And now all of a sudden, the word infertility is more effective to them because they know someone outright, direct to them, or they themselves are experiencing, they don't know how to navigate it. And it's not because it's taboo, right. because people are talking about it. It's just that every year you get new people that don't know anything about it because they've never been exposed to it. They're taught about it in school, about the Akara, Hana, you know, Rachel Imenu, Sara Imenu, Rifka. They all right. went through this. So, you know, so I'm just trying to, you know, you know, from your story, which is really unbelievable. But, you know, do you, you know, as a religious person, you know, do you, would you would you say that it might be harder to you know, your identity might be more linked to raising children, having children? Do you feel like that that is or even if if it was, you know, someone who is has like, did you have a career or anything else going on at the time that you could use to. Um, offset this challenging situation. So I was a teacher. <laughs> right. So you were around kids all day. I was around kids all day. And I used to say that my ch- my students were my kids. Wow. And I would, if a child came over to me and he needed his shoelace and I was in the middle of something, I would say to myself, one day I'm going to have a child and I want that teacher to stop what they're doing. So I would stop what I'm doing and I would tie their shoelace. Um, I would make cupcakes, individual cupcakes, like, you know, wow. for decorate, you know, for a party they were having 
or Hanukkah one year for my second grade students, I called up each parent, asked them to give me their children's names, and I made handmade. I used to decorate yarmulkes, and I would decorate a yarmulke for each boy for Hanukkah. Um, I don't necessarily think that um, we're different than you know being in the Jewish world, not Jewish world. I think it's really the same pain. A person that's trying to have a child wants to start a family. Right. I think that back to the whole sense of loss, of uh, loss of identity, I could say that one of the reasons I think that I had at one point seven jobs was because I needed to fill a void saying, I am somebody, look at me, look at me, I can do this. What were you doing? Um, so I wait, 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 just, uh, sure. just to back, back it up, I'm sorry. <laughs> when did you feel like you lost her immediately after that conversation with that doctor? Um, I don't know. I don't think I, there was ever a time that I gave it thought as to what. I think now looking back, I could right. say like it was probably a couple of weeks, couple of months later, subconsciously it was starting to happen. Wow. Um, I started taking on, let's see, so I was teaching okay. in the afternoons and then I started teaching in the mornings. And then I started to decorate yarmulkes for stores and for private clients. And this is all when you're like 20? I'm 22, 22. 23, wow. 24, 25, 26, <laughs> 27. Um, I added on, um, I worked with my husband's uncle. So after I finished working a full day, I would then work till nine in his office. Holy moly. And then, <laughs> and then I, so I gave cake decorating courses. I decorated cakes for people back before it was a thing. Right. Um, when did you get to Shaytos? Oh, yeah. Shaytos I was doing on the side. I was like, I added that when I was 25. I wow. always did it from when I was 15. But my sister was like, oh, you're really down. You should really go for a course. So I did. And then I added on, my, we were in, my husband went to Adelphia. So Rabbi Shane from uh, Adelphia, his father was, we were with him for Rosh Hashanah. And he said, you know, you should work at the mikvah. And Hashem will grant, you know, that's a way to do it. So every Sunday night I worked at the mikvah and I wow. cleaned the rooms in the mikvah. Wow. So um, I did that. So <laughs> that added wow. on. And <laughs> it wasn't like I didn't, I just wanted people to say, look, she's so good. She, like you usually hear, oh, she's such a great mother. I wanted to, even though they weren't saying it to me, for myself, I needed to know that I had a reason that I was here. Look how good I am, whether I needed it or not. It was just more for my, I guess, subconsciously. I didn't even realize what I was doing. Mm. I was just trying to fill um, the loss that I experienced with something fulfilling, making people happy. I don't know what it was, but I, I needed to do something. And so I think a lot of times, a lot of people do take on more roles, which was a problem because I didn't know how to stop <laughs> when I wanted right, to stop. Right. But um, so that's something that I think. How did your husband deal with that? So my husband was different. I remember. So I, it's very interesting. I find with a lot of couples and for us, ourselves when I was having a tough time my husband was the one that was more supportive, you know, supportive, supportive. and then when I was having mm. um, when he was having a tough time I'd be the one that would be strong for him mm. so it worked out perfectly like we were never both at a loss at the same time wow, that's awesome. meaning like when we got our bad news I had I knew I had to take the reins because my husband is a more emotional person I'm emotional but not like him. <laughs> my husband's family is extremely emotional so like they, he really took it much harder um, maybe we both took it hard, but I just had to step it look, up. It looked different. Yeah, right. I just had to step up because I knew I wanted to be there for him. Um, and, and then there were times, again, if I was down, then he would. But um, overall, I would say that I remember two years after, I had already been, I'm already adjusting possibly to this new world we're in. And I had him, I called a friend who she herself was going through fertility and I wanted him to talk to her. Because maybe he's not going to open up to me. You know, we spoke about things, but maybe if he talks to someone else who's not just his wife. So I arranged for him to talk. I said, here, you have a phone call. And I remember closing the bedroom door. And as I'm closing it, I hear him say to her, why me? Why mm -hmm. me? Why is this happening to us? And what hit me was, wait a second. I already had this question. Like, I asked that the first day. But he never had the chance to voice it. So for whatever reason, this, this is how he dealt with it. He kept it in and he asked her and then he spoke and he felt much better. Um, but we've had countless people, you know, whatever. I was very lucky that I have friends that were going through it um, and that we also had the organization eight times. There was nothing else out there, nothing. So um, I was very lucky that I was able to go to support 
groups, um, functions, and things like that. that which, which one? What was the name of the? Eight time. Eight time. So there was nothing. There was only resolve, which was the non-Jewish version. And then there came along eight time because they felt there was a need in the mm-hmm. Jewish community. Um, so I really felt like my someone was holding my hand. If I had a bad day, I you know I had a, they it was had a group. A, it wasn't just that they also had a website. They still do right, like forums, a forum, yeah. and then it was like I could be up till four in the morning. I was like, "Get to you? Are you coming to bed?" And I'm like, "I'll be there in a minute." I was like, "You're addicted to it because these are all people going through it." No and one. Knows you feel like no I one am. understands like they do. You're saying, "Oh, a hundred percent." Until you're, you're in, I always say like, I have friends that have the same diagnosis as me, and one of them came over to me once and she said, um, "You know what I'm going through?" And I said, "No, I don't." She goes, what? Of course you do. We have the same diagnosis. I said, no, we don't. We have the same diagnosis, but I don't have your family. I don't have your personality. I may know the pain you're experiencing, but do I understand what you're going through? Absolutely not. We are not two of the same people. So that makes it, I think, that's a real sense of what it is. You have a camaraderie of people that know what you're going through. Mm. but like, And for sure, people that don't even have the diagnosis, right. they don't even know... Right. So when I, I always say to people, I remember someone was going through something. I said, I'm really sorry. I wish I knew the right words to say to you, but I don't because I don't know what you're going through, but I'm here. Oh. To me, that's worth a million words, you know, a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Like, just say that to me. And that's at least someone commiserating, not offering me advice, not mm-hmm. telling me whatever I don't want to hear. Just showing me you want you understand that I'm suffering mm-hmm. and you may not know what I'm th- going through, but you understand that I'm suffering. And to me, that's a big thing. You know, people always come over with their comments or their suggestions. Mm-hmm. Like you're saying, it's not insensitive. It's just assumptions that if you were smart, you would, or you would be educated, you would know that's not something you do. You don't go over to someone and say, oh, like, you know, what kind of cancer do you have? You know, what kind of what? Cancer do you have? Oh, right. Like, right. You don't, you don't, no one says that to someone. Right. So you don't go over to someone and say, how many kids do you have? Right. Like, those are questions that you don't like, assume someone has. Right. You know, um, so those are some of the things that I think, you know. Um, so I, I just, I see people and I think this is, I'm not sure if it's insensitive, but it, it might be. And I'd like to ask you, well, when I see someone have a baby, they give kvater. Oh. To, oh. Right? That's like, it sounds like, it seems like that would be slightly insensitive, right? Oh, yeah. So I was married two years and eight time had their first medical conference. So every other year they had this medical conference now, but they had it the first time ever then. And I went prepared with all of my... Um, my folders, I was going to ask the top doctors are there. So I get to see them without having to make an appointment. And I could ask them whatever questions I want. And anyway, one of the, they had a round table during lunchtime. And um, I was sitting there and I was sitting next to Rev. Aaron Torsky. And one of my favorite topics is Shiloh, Smiku, Balim, and Skula. So I'm like all for it. Give me, because like <laughs> I'm there. And he said, I turned to him. And I remember the tears were just pouring down my face. I, I wasn't even hysterical crying. They just were pouring. And I said, is it okay to say no to Kvater? I'd already been Kvater 10 times in two years. And he said to me, he goes, anyone that asks, and he said to the whole table, really, by the way, it was a mixed table. Can you imagine? Hasidim mm-hmm. and all of sitting mixed around the table. Right. And he says, anyone that asks a couple married more than a year has chutzpah. And he said, mm-hmm. and he said, because nowadays there's so much to do. A couple could start right away. You don't know how that couple's feeling. And I found a, a sefer called Sefer Shlul Chakan. It's written by a couple. There's Hebrew on one side, English on the other. And I think it's like page 96 to 98 somewhere. It talks about how, how Rav Yashuv Zatzal or Rav Shaim Zatzal says um, they don't understand why people give the keyboard of Kfater and for to have a child and not the mitzvah of Shlul Chakan. Because the, and they wrote, there's no makar for it. And the whole Indian that someone told me was you're taking a baby and you're bringing it to the breast. You say, Hashem, just like I'm bringing this baby to the breast, give me a baby. I always, so I started this thing years ago on the, on the, someone met me and he said, he didn't have children for a while. And he said to me, he goes, um, if we have a boy, we want you to be factor. And he had other children, whatever, but he didn't have for a while. And I had a bad day. <laughs> And I opened my mouth and I said to him, why don't you just call 1-800-FATHER? And I walked away. And I felt really guilty because that's my personality. And I went on to the A-Time forum. And I wrote, I start, I titled it 1-800-FATHER. And I wrote this whole thing and how horrible I'm feeling. Right. No, it, se- it seems like you're singling out somebody. Right. And it's like, alert. 
you know, I, I feel like, I it's, feel like a, it's a strange for thing. embarrassment. Exactly. Right. So right. it's like, let's show everyone. And I remember once saying, yes, I was, I was talking with my husband, was she rubbish, and I, I was saying to him, I just got to be factor. I don't know what to do. Do I do it? Do I not? And it was someone that we were close with. And um, I babysat for them and they didn't have children right away. So right. it was like, I, I felt like I wanted to do it, but I didn't. And he's like, whatever you want to do. So I said, fine, I'll do it. Of course, I see someone I know there. Everyone's hugging me. I burst into tears. I'm like, this is it. I'm done. After right. this, I can't do it anymore. Because for people to see my emotional pain, that I didn't want. I didn't want to be a netbook. And I think a lot of couples, that's one of the things. We're just like everybody else. It's a private matter. If I choose not to talk about it, it's my private life. Right. You know, I call it, it's a bedroom topic. It's not anyone's business. Right. And um, I think that that's something that people don't take into account. Right, right, you know, exactly. I love who I've become because of my infertility. Um, I wouldn't change a thing. Um, I know that people, I know my sister right away when we got our results. She called me up and she's like, you know, why don't you adopt? I said, well, if I get to adopt, you know, I get to pick any baby I want. He's going to be cute and stunning. And, uh, gorgeous, you know? and I was like, and she was like, get to, you're not being reasonable. I go, it doesn't matter. You're telling me, I, you know, if I get to choose, it's going to be the kind that I want. Okay. <laughs> and then... Um, Many times we got calls. And I remember one time I just burst into tears. I'm like, I'm not giving this baby any of the names I had. I had a list of boys' names, like 30. One for a girl, and like 30 for boys. <laughs> and I remember, I'm not giving the baby this name because it was, and we were going to have to move to Albany for six months. It was like a very interesting situation. And I realized at the moment, I'm not ready. I'm not ready because my goal was to prove every doctor wrong. And when you're fighting a battle, you feel like, okay, you, if you're, I, in my mind, I thought if I adopt, I'm giving up. But I wasn't giving up, right. you know? But in my mind, I thought I was. So um, I realized I wasn't ready. And then we got a call about twins um, in like a January, like early December, January time, about 20 years ago. And I said, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested. But I have to tell you, I'm going to go back one second to... We had finally gotten, yes, a new procedure came out. And we thought for sure we were going to, like, this was it. I mean, I was up every morning thinking, going at 5 o'clock in the morning to be in the city for 6. So I can, you know, be there on time, be the first one in. I was happy. I was like, you couldn't bring me down because we finally got a yes and we were married seven years. And um, I remember it didn't work. And I remember saying to the doctor, we're in a little small room. And I said, and he says to me, I'm really sorry didn't work and I said so it's over that's it we're done and he said yes and I remember hysterical going into a bathroom hysterical crying gathering myself up and walking out and whatever and then um I had to go back six weeks later because he wanted to see me and while I was there I said to the doctor I said I want you to know that I thank you so much for all the support you've given me because you were, you know, I don't want to say you were my Shalia, but I said, you know, in my mind, you are my Shalia from Hashem and you did everything you could that Hashem wanted to happen. So I want to thank you. I said, but I want you to know there's a God in this world and I'm going to have a baby and I'll have it in a year and you will see, I'll be back here with a photo. <laughs> and he looks at me and he's like, mm hmm. Like a mother says, you know, to a kid who says he's going to be an astronaut, of course you will, honey, right? And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. I'm going to have a baby. And I'm going to be back here showing you the photo. Anyway, he leaves. And I hear him saying um, to the secretary, she's not hopeful. She's determined. Like, and I felt very powerful. Like, I took control. I don't care what you say. I'm in control here and not you. And there's a Hashem and that's it. Well, if the procedure would have happened, he was my due date. And um, it, it's like, it's... An amazing thing to know. And I went over to him. Oh, my he was gosh. Like a, a new, he was like six months old. And a time had done a dinner. And he was there. So I went over to him with the Wait. picture. And I was like, I don't know if you remember. He goes, of course I do. I go, you so dumb. <laughs> you see hundreds of women. I was like, I told you I would show you a picture of my baby. And here's my baby. Wow. And I may not have been able to have a baby naturally. But in every sense of the word, I remember my husband came home. I'm skipping around, but my husband came home and he's like, why are you sitting there crying and eating chocolate? <laughs> and 
morning, I'm eating a box. I hate chocolate. And I'm eating a box of chocolate. And I said, I have postpartum depression. He's like, you're crazy. <laughs> he goes, you don't. I was like, no, I'm like, I'm losing it. I'm like, this is, you know, you think you're going to have a baby. Everything's going to be like easy. And I always tell women, I said, work on your marriage now. Now's the time to work on your marriage because when that baby comes, people think babies, everything's rosy. Babies bring chaos. And as much as I predicted I was going to have heaven on earth when I would have this baby, I didn't predict um, Kalki babies. Right. So, you know, like it, it really took a toll. And Baruch we were in a good place that we could get past that. But um, so anyway, so now back to my, so we skip to my sister has a baby and at her breast, um, her husband's grandmother says to me, I want you to go to my grandfather's cave and um, I, he'll give you a baby. And I said, well, who is he? She goes, the Nomali Malach. And I said, well, it's probably expensive. She goes, no, it's not. It's like $1,000. And I'm thinking, okay, you think I'm made of money. But I decided to think about it. And I said, like you know, 17 I really... jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking, like, maybe I want to do this. So I decided I'm going to do it. I want to go. And I tried to get my husband to come with me, but he wasn't sure. He was starting a new job. And he was, you know, he ended up getting permission to go. Um, my mother got him the last seat on the plane and we're trapped. My husband's a Kohen. So that's like all, all crazy in itself because we're going to Kfar. Right, right. So he basically sat on the bus the whole time. I remember we finally got to Lejeune's Gana Matzah Shabbos. It was freezing. Like, and I, and when I told my grandfather I'm going, he said, did you pack boots? And he said, I said, no, why? He's like, you're going to Poland and you didn't pack boots? Like, I was what are you thinking? So I remember... I couldn't stay in Daven as hard as the other women there. Um, I kept thinking, I'm so cold. I need to go get a hot cocoa. Now, it's not 27, 20, 20 years ago. It wasn't even as packed as it was today. Right. It was empty. I was able to go into like the little, they had like a, a downstairs room and you went in, you got yourself your hot tea or your coffee or your right. cocoa and soup. And I was just constantly, and every time I went out, I was like freezing again. I won't tell you, I kept thinking about the Holocaust survivors that what anyone that went through the Holocaust how did they survive on just mm-hmm. what they wore because I was wearing two layers of sweatpants a skirt two layers of socks sweatshirts and a coat and gloves and, and I was still freezing um and I just kept I remember coming home and saying I did say someone said you have to ask for a baby and because we all became very close on the bus and I I remember saying to, so when I walked in the first time um, it was by Reichberg Tours, and he, the women were waiting on the side, and the men were all in the caver. And he said, "I want you to let the women out, let the women come in, men leave." And he and the men would, two of the men wouldn't leave. And he said, "They have a right to dive in just like you." Out, and the women, they were all grabbing each other. So some woman grabs me and puts my arm on the on the fence, the golden fence around the caver, and I just burst into tears. It was like all of a sudden I felt like. Okay, I'm davening and, and I'm asking you for a baby. And this time I didn't say how in a year or whatever. Just give me a baby, please. And um, whatever. And I just remember coming home and saying to the... I went straight from the airport. Haven't slept in like... Literally, we left on a Wednesday night. We didn't sleep till Friday. I hardly lit can I barely made it to the candle lighting. And then again, through the night. I got... We came back. I went to work at the mikvah. And then I remember talking to the head of a time and saying to him, I don't think Hashem's going to answer my tefillos because I didn't dive in hard enough. And I I couldn't stay. It was so cold. And all these other women, they stayed for four hours in the freezing cold saying to him, and I couldn't do it. There's no way he heard me. And I, I always say, like, we are our worst obstacle because <laughs> we will, we decide what Hashem can do. And not mm-hmm. what we don't just say, okay, it's possible. We decide that Hashem can't do it, so it can't be done. And um, two days later, my mother-in-law called me. It was a Tuesday night, and she said, Yeti, there's a baby available. Do you want it? And for the first time, I had the feeling, and I said, I want this. I want it. And I remember a few years earlier when we got one of our calls, I remember saying to our therapist, we were back and forth, my husband was interested, I wasn't. And I said, but if I say no, what if Hashem says, well, I'm sorry, I gave right. you your this chance. Your you chance. Never get, this was your chance. Yeah. You're never getting it again. And we are so lucky that we had such an amazing therapist because he said to us, I don't know about you, 
but my Hashem doesn't work that way. Because I was always raised that like tit for tat. If you do this, Hashem's going to do this. So like I was afraid that I would, wouldn't get what I wanted out of whatever it was because I did something bad. And um, he said, so when he said that, I was like, what? Really? Wow, what a concept. Like Hashem is not tit for tat. Hashem is actually someone who's loving and caring. He doesn't punish me because I have a bad thought or I say no to something. And then so when we got the call about him, I was like, I want this. And um, we spoke it over. My husband and I spoke it over. He said, whatever you want, Yeti. And um, that was it. And then wow. a week and a half later, he was born. So, and he was wow. named Eli Mela right. because everyone I said, put, you I don't mess with no Eli Mela. <laughs> Very wow. 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 Fascinating. So. Okay, we have to we have to go to Alan Mallet now. Then we're um, gonna come back to you. That's why I ended with this. <laughs> you want a, you want a question? No, I mean or? like it's it definitely like just as a you know adoption in, in the from community is is a, is not super common, right? Would you say that? It's not super common, but I know I know after we adopted, many of my friends from a time adopted also. Do you think that that was that a challenge or something to like just that fact alone to do? Was that like a something that was hard? To do what to just take the just to, to to adopt like to have is no. like that was not hard no no okay cool it just it's very hard to adopt in New York because New York laws are very different than any other state oh, right? we have the toughest laws so it makes it difficult for New York families to adopt if they want to um, they they you have to go by a certain code and the strict laws and Queens has even tougher <laughs> so we're really blessed. Um, but, um, other than that, I think that once you realize that it's, you're filling a void, the, the, what I realized was I wasn't giving up. I'm still going to keep trying. Um, okay. So now I'm 48 and I'm like, <laughs> okay, the doctors were right. So it's been an emotional roller coaster over the last two years, which I never gave thought to it, that they could be right. I hate that they're right. Really hate it. But, um, I got two of the most amazing gifts in the world. Someone right. recently said, my nephew got married and someone said at the Mitzvotans, um, the Bachman, Gadi Fuchs, he was saying that the Nisham must come down from the past, so that I knew. But he said, I forgot who he quoted, um, the Nisham was of the future, your future children and grandchildren come down, and I burst into tears. I was like, I was supposed to have none. And that means that my two boys came down, Hashem sent them down for me as like a gift. So if I'm not supposed to have any, and now Hashem just sent me these two, I I was gone. I couldn't stop crying because I realized, like, wow, my children, my boys were there. And Hashem knew that they would be there for me. And that's for my future grandchildren. No, no. My grandchildren, no pressure. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Ali Malach, do you, do you remember finding out you were adopted? Or, like, it was just a fact no, I think every second time it's just a fact. Like, there's never any point in my life where we had a sit down discussion. I was like, all right, come sit down, we'll have a talk. Yeah, you're adopted. It wasn't like that. It was just as a baby, growing up, like, we had this one book. It's about a bunch of birds in the tree and uh, like, all the eggs hatch and there's not enough space. And there's one kangaroo that can't have kids and the kangaroo just happens to be at the bottom of the tree. And the bird, one of the birds, is not enough space. It just gets pushed out of the tree, falls in the kangaroo's pouch. The kangaroo's like, oh, look, the kid, and then they just raise it and they look happy ever after. It's this is sounds. a great book. What book is this? It's called. Oh my gosh, I was gonna bring it. I can't remember what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> we gave it out to all our friends that adopted. We, can't, awesome. we bought the books out. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of the little golden you know? books. No, it's my little birdie. A blessing from above. Uh, so a blessing okay. from yeah, above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Very so. nice. So you remember, like, no. getting that read to you? No. Yeah, but like, never like one the first time it happened. I was like, whoa! It was just like, it's just like a bedtime story that just happened to apply in my life, and that was pretty much it. Like, nothing past that. Like, a lot of this story is, like, comes to terms, like, accepting. It's just, like, part of my life. It's just normal. This way my life is. All right, it's great. Did you, did other people question you about it? Like, did it become a thing, like, that you felt different than the other boys? Um, yeah, I felt different, right? It's nothing you do about that. I, I am different. But I know, I know way to slice it up differently. But, like, if somebody questions, asks questions, yeah, you answer truthfully. It's like, I'm not worse than you. You're not better than me. I'm just different. We're not the same. But that's all it was. I do remember you were in, I think, second or third grade. You came home and you told me a boy said, ha ha, you're adopted. So he looked at me and goes, it just means I have parents like you. <laughs> right. You know, so. Yeah. 
I don't look at anything different. It's just like, oh, I have parents, you have parents, we're all the same. All right. So we mm-hmm. told him from day one. Right. Day one, I would say, you're my matama from Hashem, because I wanted to just get used to it. And I believe that if you make it like part of life, it is part of life, so there's right. no difference. And I mean, there are differences, obviously, like he's saying, but like, there's no nervousness to towing around something. It's just part of it. And um, and then one of my friends who adopted three years later told me, every week I practice saying, you're adopted to my baby. And I was like, wow, she goes, oh, the words should just flow. And I was like, oh, I never did that. So I started doing, when he was three, I would say, you know, you're adopted, you know what that means, you come from Shemayim, you know, Hashem gave you to us, and you're our gift, and whatever. And then, so it just like became regular. Mm. And then when my second one was born, you, he was like, I don't know, three, four months, and he was like seven. And he leaned down to him, and he goes, you know you're adopted, but that's okay, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> So, like, I felt good, like, you know, that we made it like it's a normal thing. He went mm-hmm. when my second one was born, we took him to court with us so he could see that oh, we were wow. finalizing mm-hmm. it. Then we all went out for um, lunch, for breakfast, whatever it was. And then after that, we sent him to Yeshiva with um, cupcakes. Oh, and right. he gave it out. And my friend, new baby. Called, right. yeah, and my friend calls mm-hmm. me up and she says, you know, <laughs> um, Mary Yaakov's mom, Mary Yaakov came home. Mary Yaakov yeah, sure. He came home and he goes, you know, Ellie Melch's adopted. Why can't we adopt? <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. And we were like, she goes, yeah, you're making it really difficult for me. <laughs> so it's like the cool thing. So. All right. So it's just a normal part of yep. life for you. Nothing different. To... <laughs> Well, Tati is a Kohen. That was right. I, I know. So, yeah, I was yeah. trying to figure out how to, how to ask that. So how does, how does that work in terms of Kohan? It, like, does, that doesn't pass so down if it's friend. not biological? So or? after we adopted, um, we have a friend from a, a friend of ours from a time who came over to me at a time does a Shabbaton. So we were there together. He was a baby and almost a year. And my friend comes over to me. She pulls me aside and she says, we want, we're looking to adopt, but my husband's a Kohen. How's it going? I said, I won't lie where, you know, it's scary. You know, your, 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 your husband's a Cohen and your child is not. I said, but we're making the best of it. And, you know, we spoke right away to Robbie Finkelman and we wanted to get advice from him and he gave us some advice, you know, and we spoke to people that there are people out there that are Kohanim and their kids are adopted. And so we spoke into them just to get guidance and that was it. But mm-hmm. We we just hope that we gave him enough of a self esteem and a you know right. something to fight it and any of his feelings. But I think everybody in life has something that they go through and they have to come to terms with one way or another. And it's part of a struggle and it only makes right. you stronger. So, did you feel like when you were able to have Eli Malik, did you feel like you didn't need to do all those jobs to that? Oh, I had to mm. quit. So I had to quit the mikvah because. <laughs> he was colicky so that mm-hmm. was like easy but did you also feel like a void was so my void was definitely filled um and i was able yeah i stopped a lot of the stuff like i stopped cake decorating i just made cakes for family um i stopped the yarmulkes i didn't teach as many hours do you recommend for people who are struggling to adopt earlier on if you can only if you're ready like, I know that our therapist, my husband asked the therapist, why did you tell Yeti to go ahead with adoption? And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't for it. And it wasn't like he wasn't for it, just like he was nervous. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know, okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, we're a little so, at this point. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, because Yeti is the main caregiver. So all the other times that I said no, that was the reason why he said, okay, you can't adopt. Because I wasn't ready to be the one. And I'm the main caregiver, so I have to take care of him. So if a woman is not ready and the husband is, I would say that you want the wife is the one that, you know, she's there in the home. So I wouldn't recommend it unless the couple both, you know, talk to someone, they see someone, they talk to each other about it. Um, When I wanted, my husband didn't. When my husband did, I didn't. You know, so it was like a back and forth kind of thing. But this was the first time that, innately i felt i want this so bad so i think it's really based on a person's feeling mm-hmm. everyone's experience is different some people make a conscious decision by me it was an emotional decision it was the first time i ever got that like Woo, i want this 
And then you felt the same way that seven years later? So seven years later, we were trying. And we got many calls. Um, and they just fell through. And okay. it's like you're going kind of through a miscarriage, I guess, because like you're expecting this and nobody knew. We didn't tell our families. So mm-hmm. like they don't know that we're going through this emotional state trying to adapt and we're about to get a baby and then the baby doesn't come to us. So you don't say anything. So like when we were adopting my second one, I was dropping him off at school and I said to him, um, what if I tell you we're about to get a gift? Can I tell you a secret? And he's like, what? I said, what if I tell you we're about to, I'm going to bring home a gift today. And he says, um, what kind of gift? I said, what if I tell you it's a baby? And he goes, well, is it going to be a boy? I go, maybe. I didn't want to give it even a, a gender because I was afraid that what if it right. didn't happen? Many times you get to the hospital. I've had friends go to the hospital and then the birth mother changed her mind. Wow. And they went with a car seat. They were expecting to take a baby home. Holy moly. So he says, I said, if it is, I said, what if it is? And he goes, well, if it's a boy, can I wear a tie? And I to the bris, and I said, you can wear whatever you want. They didn't need to wear a tie. It was yes, one of the best did. days of my life. We kind <laughs> of had an argument that morning because I had a cute outfit for him, but he wanted that tie. And I said, okay, it's your tie. That's it. Oh. But I basically said to him um, when we came back, the first thing, he, he jumps in the car and he goes, you got it? I go, I got it. And oh, really we cool. have a picture of him looking at him and everything. But like, it was a long day. We didn't. We were there for six hours waiting for the birth mother to, you know, relinquish, and then we had to go get the baby. It was like a whole big, wow, full day. <laughs> that also could be a, a big, you know, challenge to to be able to do that. Yeah. So you have your lawyers, and you have to hire a lawyer for her, and it's like there's a whole bunch of processes that go into it. But um, yeah. So who walked you through all of that? That whole process, like a time, does that. So a time now, a lot of couples call us. My husband and I help run that. Um, there are other people that also are involved in the adoption aspect. We guide couples. We give them the names to our lawyers. Some people call us from out of state. We tell them, you know, what to do, where to look for, what, you know, like I had to find, he was born in the state of Michigan, so we had to find a lawyer in Michigan. Um, how I chose my lawyer is I'm like funny like that. I had three lawyers. So I went eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and I said, I should pick one. <laughs> and that's how we got our lawyer. And they were amazing. Amazing. Um, so they really guided us every step of the way. Um, some people go through an agency, so the agency will set them up that way. And everything is answered that way. But, um, yeah, so we basically, we started out with like a semi-open adoption. And then it just basically, you know, fizzled out. But, what does that um, mean? means that we were sending her photos. Okay. Him. And uh, she had requested them, and so we sent them, and then eventually it just fizzled out, and that was it. So, some couple nowadays okay. it's more open to have an open adoption, but a lot of couples. What do you mean open adoption? Meaning that the birth mother is involved in the in the life of the child, like she comes for visits and like like they, that. Right. Wow, that could be. But a lot, right, so a lot of couples for are ner- right. So a lot of couples are very nervous about that, and that's something I always tell them: be make sure you find out, or if you put down, you do not want an open adoption. Right. If that's the course you want to take. Got it. Right. So, do you ever wonder about uh, your biological parents? Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's it, but it right now in my life is so much going on. Right, like you know, I gotta get married soon. I'm gonna college. Gonna come back to Israel. <laughs> oh my gosh, okay. I think you're freaking <laughs> out. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> no, but I don't. <laughs> I don't. I, it's, it's She's very, in here. All right, come on. In. <laughs> it's a, it's a big it's a big curveball thrown into your life like that, especially if I don't know where they live now, but if they live out of state, it can take up a lot of time, a lot of like mind space even, and it's just it's not something you want when your life's just still changing. You want to have a stable life before you do something like that. Like I've spoken to people about this. Like other people went through similar things. I got a guy come speak my shiva, Puerto Rican gear, like flew in from Puerto Rico when he was like. 14, walked into the bar park, said, I want to become Jewish. Like, he had a crazy, crazy story. And so after he spoke, I spoke with him privately. And I asked him, like, what do you think I should do? Because, like, he still is in touch with his parents. And he's like, it's a big strain on you, especially if they're not religious. And you're religious, then they look to you sometimes for answers. And that's that's a lot to put on you. And you don't really, you really don't want to do that unless you have, like, a really, really stable life. And got so it. right now, everything's still changing. So mm-hmm. I don't want to do that now. Got it, got it. And how would wow. you feel about that? I think he can answer that. How would we feel about that if he decided? I think they'd back up with every decision I made. We've spoken about it. That he knows that he can ask us any questions and we will be there to answer. I feel that the second you, a parent, says, 
freaks out. I once had this, uh, someone, we didn't have kids yet. And so we know had an adoptive child and the child was getting very upset and annoyed or whatever. And he wanted to search for his birth parents and the birth mother um, was really upset. She didn't know how to deal with it. And I tried to explain her point of view that if I ever got to adopt, you know, she looks at you as you're her child. So, you know, for you wanting to search for your birth mother and now you're throwing this on her, um, she may be, it's kind of freaking her out that maybe you're resenting her. I said, so I never wanted that that feeling, that, that uh, relationship to happen between me and my kids. So my husband and I made the conscious decision that we will always answer whatever questions they have um, from the start. Because the second you start taking a step back, I think that's when they start feeling like, oh, what don't you want me to know? You want to, you, you're against something. You, you don't like something. And we support him whatever he needs. If that's what's going to make him happy, that's what a parent should be doing. So whenever we've spoken once or twice, um, we've had discussions, especially during COVID, lots of discussions. <laughs> and, you know, and we said whatever you need. Whenever you're ready, you come to us and we'll help you. And that's it. So. Oh. It's very selfless. <laughs> saying that's a that's how parents should be. They right. should be selfless just, toward their kids. A lot of thought goes into Even it. though there's a, a heavy emotional yeah, aspect but I, to it. But he said it very well. He wrote, an, you know, he was interviewed recently by the Ami magazine. And he said it very well. A parent is, what did you say? The parent is who raises you. A parent is oh, who yeah, raises you. Yeah, yeah. A parent is who raises you. So what? So let's say they want to find a long distant relative that you don't like. Okay, it's not the end of the world. So you get over it. You know, what's right. the worst? They're not happens? replacing you. They're not replacing right. me. You know, my father used to call me up um, when he was little. He would call me up and he'd say, "Yeti, I want you to practice. Say it. You were born from my heart and not from my tummy, but that's okay. Like something like that." And I would say, "Okay, Tati, fine, no problem." You know, um, he's not a kohen, Yeti practice he could be David Hamela he could be the next king of, of of Bnei Yisrael you practice and say it and it was like such a bracha because um you know it being brought up in a Kohen household um it's a big thing and he went through one when he was like 10 he had a hard time with you know the kahuna part um and I remember I went into him and my father had passed away and I was like devastated because like he was my rock but everything he had me prepare, I was able to go into his room, and he was upset. And I sat there and said, you know, you could be the next David HaMelech. You may not be a Kohen, but you could be David HaMelech. And, you know, you were born from, I said everything he said, you were born from my heart, not from my stomach, but that's okay. You know, not every, every family is created differently. And whatever. So those are some of the things that I was able to take from my father and also bring to him. So I think he's an awesome dude. So <laughs> he knows I'm in awe of him. I'm like, <laughs> wait, do you do you know other people who are adopted? No, you don't. Top of my head. Oh, besides your brother. Oh yeah, right. my brother. Other than that, oh, not really. Steve Jobs was adopted. Ooh. Aaron Judge was adopted. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. Right. No, <laughs> actually, we went to an <laughs> endocrinologist years ago. Not not an, an ENT, not an endocrinologist, an ENT, and. He was asking us questions, and he says, oh, you're a Kohen? So he was six, and I said, no, Ellie Malik's not a Kohen. Ellie Malik has adopted. And he said, wow, that's so special. And he looks at Ellie Malik, and he says, you know, this week's Parsha, Basia adopted Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu. And he never even gave it thought. And he says, you know, Moshe Rabbeinu was adopted. And then he looked at it because his father was adopted after the Holocaust and he has a special place and whatever. But it was like I had never given thought to that Moshe was adopted by Basia. Yeah. But she, he grew up in the household of Paro. Yeah. So I feel like the Torah is always involved in some way. Yeah. <laughs> right. Everything yeah. that, right. Oh, all yeah, the challenges so that we Hannah go through are there. was my person. Right. Hannah and I are like best friends. <laughs> we all had lots of paninas in our lives. Oh, my gosh. Right, so. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah. Wow. Trying to think about anything else to ask you. <laughs> uh, much. Everything's pretty much crossed on. It's the claim thing was the only thing that I ever really had a problem with. Like, other than that, no, nah, it's just life, you know, it's just the way life is. That and looks, it's the only thing we ever gotten. Like, right. I had random people say, I remember I was just chilling in class one day, and he's like, oh, I bumped into your mom in the pizza store. I'm like, oh, that's pretty. He's like, yeah, she looks nothing like you. 
And he didn't know. One of my friends sitting on my left did, and my friend just starts dying of laughter. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you don't actually get that all the time. That's so strange. And the guy's like, oh, okay, cool. And he leaves, and my friend just dying, trying so hard not to say anything. You know, it's it's not a secret. It's some reason right. sometimes people will say things. Right. I also like when he doesn't duck in with my husband. Oh, that uh, there was that were, there was a fun story. We were out of town. And we're out of town for Yontif, and one of the, my father goes to the and I'm just like chilling, my own business. I'm glad I was learning after davening, so I'm like, hey, look a guy, right? Like a beard, everything, and he's like, he's trying to be like super nice, and he's like, you know, dochening, it's it's really not for you. You're giving a brach to the little and it's really not nice if you don't go up. And oh. I'm with all my cousins, oh, no. I'm with all my cousins, and they're all in the back, and again, they're all just dying of laughter, and this guy just, he doesn't pick up on that and he just keeps talking. He's just like, yeah, and you're giving a brach to everybody. So really, it's not for you. It's like, trust me, it's not embarrassing at all to go up. Nobody's judging you. And I'm just like, oh, thanks, bro. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I got you. And he's just he's going, 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 going. And I wanted to say something to him so bad. But at the same time, I, like, he wouldn't have been able to sleep that night. Like, it would have been so awkward. Wow. So I'm just like, all right, thanks, yeah. man. I'll, I'll really think about that. And he just went on his way. <laughs> wow. he just, just walked away. Didn't say anything to him. And my cousin, everyone's just dying of laughter. I'm just trying so hard not to die of laughter. It's just it was funny moments. But again, the little things. No one's ever intentionally said anything. Right, like even the teen minion that you went to. Which one was that? Oh, right, Weberman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this guy runs a teen minion. in the, I think it was in Shayashiv at the time. Yeah, at the time. And he's got like a very like twisted sense of humor. And, like, he didn't not even know I was there or, you know, he didn't care. He forgot. So, it wasn't, like, intentional. And he's, like, we need a client to get our friend Aaliyah. And he's, like, is anyone here a client? And, I'm like, no, you're He's, like, is anyone's father a client? And I raised my hand. And, <laughs> <laughs> he, and he wasn't expecting he wasn't him expecting to raise his hand. hand. <laughs> I mean, he, didn't know, he didn't know I was there. He wasn't thinking about me. And, again, he just starts laughing. Everyone starts laughing. It's just cute. <laughs> That's funny. He has a great sense of humor. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Recently read was the autobiography of Steve Jobs. Okay. Never read it. <laughs> well, see, and 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 um, and you know, one of the things that you know he he talks about, he was adopted, um, and it's like really moving. So you know, like the pout, like that, you know, he he. I don't think he even wanted to see his birth mother because it was like too. It was too. It was like, like he felt like, why would I do that? But you know, just the the thought of, you know. You know, it's a very powerful thing to see, you know, somebody, you know, who has a challenge. You know, it's not it's not easy to, to have that a burden, but to 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 have that and, and to still do whatever it is that you're doing is extremely, you know, even if it's not, you know, Steve Jobs did build Apple. Well, he's but, saying it's not really a burden. But I'm saying, him, he, but, right? You know, I'm, I mean, yeah, no, correct me not. if I'm wrong. Like, you don't feel that it's a burden. No, no. You you're just, right. it's different it's and different's fun. Like, right. everybody has differences. Maybe, exactly. So I know someone angry at his birth like he doesn't want to know who his birth parents are right but his parents who raised him are like his end all right so there are i think it's how everyone's personality is different the same way like i always say in infertility everyone's journey is so different than the next one right because i'm open doesn't mean that the next person is open about it i have friends that are beyond private and they have a right to be Right. I'm open because I feel like maybe there's someone I could help by being open. And there's someone sitting alone in her bedroom in the corner crying and feeling like she's totally alone. Right. And then so when I talk about it on my Instagram page, I'm open about it because there's so many dynamics that go through infertility. It's not just your diagnosis. It's also everyone else's personalities that are around you. You have people that want to give you advice. You have people that don't understand what to say. And what not to say. Um, I, I always tell people, like, I could be that stupid person. I have a friend whose husband was an after from Lou Gehrig's disease. And for years, I couldn't, I could pick up a phone and talk to her. Right. But I didn't know what came out of my mouth. So I came up with a plan that I would just say, you know, I'd pick up a phone and I would leave a message. And I felt that that was a great tool. Mm-hmm. And I always say, like, everyone needs their tools, whether you're going through one challenge or another. You try your bag of tools, and sometimes you have to buy new tools. Right. And those tools get you through the day, get you through whatever it is you're, you know, you know what works for you. For me, at one point, I couldn't go to a breast. I couldn't be at the actual breast, but I would show up for the meal. Because while I am stuffing my face and you're saying a message by you, I'm feeling great. You know what? Thank you. Not paying attention because I'm focusing on something else. Right. Um, I do want to end with one thing. Um, if you want to ask me a question after that, that's fine. <laughs> but I, I was telling someone recently about the Emetz Shem Bayuz. It really gets to me. And um, for years, I remember 
um, I came up with this plan when I was married six years already that I don't want to be a Nebuch. I don't want people to look at me as a Nebuch. So I remember at one of my brother-in-law's weddings, I made sure I looked to kill. So much so my sister-in-law said, so what are you wearing? I said, I'm going to look better than the Kala. <laughs> I needed my, my self-esteem to feel like I am more than just my infertility because I always say you don't want infertility to define you. You know, you don't want your adoption to define you. You're more than all that. It's just the terminology. Um, so I remember saying that I swirled, someone would say, I him by you, of course. And I would twirl around like I was like one of the evil stepsisters of Cinderella. If you ever saw the movie, they yeah. walk with their head high and they walk away. And mm-hmm. I literally walked away and I was thinking, they're saying she's not a Neva. She's like, wow, you know, but it was, they may not have been saying it, but it was what I needed to hear in my head. Um, with the Emetz Shambayus, I know people really believe that they're giving a bracha and they mean it wholeheartedly. I wouldn't put that in an insensitive, you know, category. I do believe that when you're saying Emetz Shambayus, whether it's a single person or a person going through infertility, what you're doing to them at that moment is you have no idea if they either, either never had a date in the last six months, they had no date in the last six months mm. or a year, or if they just broke up with someone. And, or they thought they were about to get engaged, you know, or they were dating, whatever, whatever reason, or someone who may have had a miscarriage, failed a cycle, can't do anything. They know they're never going to have children because the doctor diagnosed them with that. And you say, Amit Shem by you. So what you've mm-hmm. created is a situation where the person then smiles at you, says, thank you, turns around, walks straight to the bathroom and bursts into tears. What kind of bracha is that? The biggest bracha you can give those people is saying, wow, you look great tonight. Mazel tov. So nice seeing you. You don't even have to say you look great. Just say, oh, it's so nice seeing you. Mazel tov. Walk away. You just ha- heard them say, they could breathe. No one is focusing on them. No one is giving them their bracha. That is the dreaded bracha. Now there is, I always say, the 1% that believe that that's a great bracha. Okay. You have to know who the person is. Some people really take it. There was a woman that spoke for a time who said she loves looking at children's buses it gives her such hana and i'm like okay no i remember mm-hmm. my friend and i were at the eight time shabbaton and we were talking and we we're both eyeing each other oh this is bad like you're telling this to a bunch of women who are newly in infertility you're already 60 and you're telling them how you get hana seeing my separatious right in front of you <laughs> you know like you don't do that so we tried to do our damage control saying you know not everyone's like that whatever <laughs> but the point is that Think before you talk. Stop 10 seconds. Try to put yourself into that, that person's shoes. If it's even possible, which it's not. Because mm-hmm. I always said, like I said before, you can't. But think. Sometimes thinking, stopping for 10 seconds and seeing if you could just say, wow, you look great. Malatav, nice seeing you. Right. And don't ask the question, how many kids do you have? Mm-hmm. Right. There. Okay. <laughs> so that's it. So we could, end, we could end on that note. That's good <laughs> advice. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. It um, it was really enjoyable. I was on the sidelines. I don't know if you heard me at any point, but um, it was one of those conversations that I was like, wow, this is really empowering. This is powerful. Um, this is great. It's great insight. And, and it was, I, I really personally enjoyed it. If you or someone you know are struggling, going through something, in the mental health space and you could use the help of a therapist or psychologist or psychiatrist you could turn to relief relief is a fantastic organization we love them you go to reliefhelp.org or you could give their phone number a call at 718-431-9501 or you can send them an email info at reliefhelp.org they're not for profit they do not charge and they will hook you up with a psychologist therapist psychiatrist i meant the psychologist psychiatrist therapist that they'll charge you um but they understand they get to understand who you are what you really need and they are a team of incredible people who have a rolodex of incredible uh, mental health professionals and if you enjoyed this episode go ahead and give the clutch chicks a thumbs up leave a comment every comment you leave i don't know why but it helps our videos so leave a comment if you're watching this on youtube tell us something that you enjoyed about this episode maybe tell us a guest that you want to hear and as well if you're listening on apple Podcasts or spotify go ahead and give us five stars every single time you do it boom yoni and i give each other a high five and we've been giving each other a lot of high fives lately so keep us giving the high fives 
Till next time, stay safe. Living L'chaim.